Hello, welcome to the New Stack Makers, a podcast where we talk about at scale application development, deployment, and management. We'd like to thank Cloud Native Computing Foundation for sponsoring our podcast from Cloud Native Con Kubicon, Berlin. Thanks very much for the support here. We've had a great show. Hey, it's Alex Williams with the New Stack here at Cloud Native Con Kubicon, Berlin. And I'm here with Alexis Richardson, CEO of Weave, and co I think you're one of the co-founders. Right? I am one of the co-founders. And I wanted to talk with you a little bit about you know what we're seeing inside the CNCF, and particularly kind of some of the relates to the new projects. Yeah. We had RK RKT from uh, CoreOS. That's right. Uh, Container D from Docker. That's right. Both landed today, and I think there was a round of applause in the auditorium. What does that when allow? People saw that. What is that? Well, why is that significant? Well, the new stack, the modern architectures, consist of containers, orchestration, and other tools to support microservices and dynamic environments. Tools like Linkerd, gRPC, Prometheus. And so what we're doing with Containerd and RKT is we're showing a commitment to go down to the container layer and make sure that we have choice and interoperability right down to the container layer for your orchestration, for your next-gen apps to do that are cloud native. And I believe that Containerd in particular has shown commitment to work with all the different orchestration systems, which is why Docker have seen a good purpose to go forward here and put Containerd into the CNCF. Systems like you know, ECS, Kubernetes, as well as their own Docker Swarm, of course. So you're, you're so it's, talk to me a little bit more about Containerd then. But for the audience out there, explain what it, what it is actually and how it, you know, how it, uh, is different maybe than, than, than other approaches, or what, what gap does it fill? So there's a lot of things in, in Docker that are designed to give the user a complete end-to-end -end Docker experience for lots of different parts of functionality. Uh -huh. Some of those overlap with systems like Kubernetes and Amazon ECS, to name two examples. Tim Hockin at the last Docker meetup, Container D Summit, I think it was, in February, stood up and made a speech about, or gave a talk about Kubernetes and Containerd, and he said, what's really great about Containerd from a Kubernetes point of view is it's just enough Docker to make Kubernetes work well, but not too much. So Containerd really is the piece inside Docker that drives the container engine, rather than doing the whole full-scale platform orchestration, allowing you to use Kubernetes or Docker Swarm or one of the other orchestrators. Across, so you can use Container D across any one of those. That's that's the idea. Now, <clears throat> this is reasonably new technology. It's been inside Docker for some time, but this splitting it, splitting it out is is is, is an important step. Um, it's not complete yet. So today, you're using Kubernetes with Docker, for example, but very soon you'll be seeing people using Kubernetes with Container D and other things with Container D. And the same should be true for RKT. So today, RKT and Kubernetes go together. I hope to see RKT picked up by other people too. What does this do for commercial distributions? Then, uh, what does this provide the the you know the the provide what does this provide the, the the companies that are offering these commercial distributions of Kubernetes? It provides stable, commonly held, boring infrastructure right. that we can all use, and so we can all focus on adding value to our customers and not you know fighting over the details of what's going on inside the container because that's too low level for most users to care about. Yeah, that's what it provides. It allows us to focus on adding value. So tell me about Weave and and wh where is it you guys are seeking to add value in in this in this ecosystem? So what we like about Weave, we've been running uh, Kubernetes ourselves in production with Prometheus on Amazon and some other pieces of the cloud native stack for over eighteen months, multiple zones, multiple clusters, dev staging and production, and we've learned the painful way what's right and what's wrong about running a large scale orchestrated container cluster for your applications. And what we've done with our product, Weave Cloud, is we are taking those features that we've realized they're important and making them available to someone using any orchestrator, any cluster they like. 
especially Kubernetes, because here, we're here at KubeCon today, but our stuff works with ECS and Docker as well. Uh, the idea is that you own your cluster, you own your code, you're a developer, you stand these things up yourself, or you go to GKE, they give you a cluster. That's then your cluster. Or on Amazon ECS, you get a cluster from there too. Weave Cloud adds value by being an add-on to that after the fact. So we don't replace your cluster or interfere with how you work. If you then buy our product, what you get is things like monitoring, both application monitoring, full stack monitoring, right down to the infrastructure. You get fault resolution, you get incident management, you get management and troubleshooting through an interactive screen, which is highly visual, visualization as well. You get network security and you get continuous deployment, all rolled up together, just enough of each to give you an operational tool to add to your cluster. So it's like buying New Relic, except we're giving you more. So is this then available, can you run this across you know, AWS and Google Cloud and? It will work wherever we can see your cluster. So today we're launching Weave Cloud EE, which is going to take us into the behind the firewall, into the enterprise, and allow us to work more closely with people running clusters on their own machines. But up until now, with standard Weave Cloud, Anywhere you want to run your clusters, if we can see it, whether it's Google Cloud or Azure or Amazon, we can connect. Our own stack is running on Amazon EC2, and we haven't yet seen a need to run it on multiple clouds, but I'm sure that will happen one day. You run it on Amazon EC2 right now? Yeah, we do, yeah. Right. <clears throat> how, help me understand how, how, how that's just enough for you. You say you don't need it now to right. run on multiple clouds. The reason we might need to run it on multiple clouds is, for example, if a user was saying on Azure and wanted our service to be on Azure as well uh. Uh, for latency reasons. But our, our service is not particularly latency sensitive, so that's not super important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then there's, tell us then about Weave Flux. What is Weave Flux? So our cloud product rolls up all these pieces of functionality that right. I described. But what it really is under the hood is a complete cloud native stack with different open source projects covering different pieces of the functionality that I mentioned. One of them is WeFlux. That is a continuous deployment and release automation tool. It sits in between your image repository, which could be key.io from CoreOS or, or Docker Hub, or, and your build system, which could be Travis, or it could be Google Container Builder or it could be shippable. So you have those things to build your images, and then you also have a bunch of different dev clusters, prod clusters running on your choice of cloud, your choice of infrastructure, and you're deploying images onto those all the time. And you're going to roll them back, and you're going to deploy them in different places. Sometimes you'll have three or four different versions of the same service on the same cluster, because you're doing tests like A-B testing, or some kind of stage rollout. And Flux joins the dots to integrate between those two places, the image repo and the cluster, to make that simple, repeatable, consistent, automated, and auditable. So with Kubernetes right now, it's pretty young, right? It's a, it's, you know, it's a young orchestration technology. Orchestration in the container sense is pretty new. Yeah. Um, are there patterns, though, that you're starting to see emerge? With, with, in particular, I'm thinking with continuous delivery? I think so. I mean, what most users want is they don't want to see the infrastructure. We talked a few minutes ago about boring infrastructure yeah. and the importance of having container D, working with Kubernetes in one standardized right. foundation. You know, Kubernetes is really part of the infrastructure too. Uh, what people want is they want to write code and they want to deploy it anywhere and they want to be able to scale it the way they like and they want to be able to have multiple different types of applications web apps, data processing applications, machine intelligence applications, all the kinds of things that we're going to build in the future. And to do that, what they need is an end-to-end -end solution. So what we're seeing emerge this year is a joined up end-to-end -end solution. Right now, that consists of multiple different parts. The app, the build, the container cluster, the deployment tool, and all the execution support, or as I like to call it, A, B, C, D, E, for your end-to-end -end solution but they're different technologies. And we're seeing vendors like ourselves step up to join the dots to make that easy for users. So CD is just one link in that chain. Right, right. So joining the dots, how else are the dots joining then? A lot of people build things by hand. And you know, Kubernetes and Docker Swarm and the other tools 
we'll give you an API so that you as the developer can deploy an app. When you get started, you should be able to start a cluster and deploy your first Hello World application without too many moving parts. That's kind of day zero. But then on day one, you decide to roll out an app into production, and you realize that you might need to do a rollback. So you need a, then you need a new tool that supports rollback. And then you start having more than one team, more than one cluster, more than one service. As soon as you do that, you have a management problem, because you need to track what's running where, who deployed what when, if something goes wrong, whose fault was it, all of this kind of stuff. And then you need release automation. So it's, it's a journey. So that's why there are different tools at each point. I think over time, this will become more and more stable and clear. So we're sort of starting to see that journey emerge. That's right. We're starting to see that journey emerge this year. I think it's very exciting. What have you learned in your 18 months in running you know, uh, your cloud? Very good question. So we have learned the importance of centralized configuration in a source code control system. I strongly recommend everybody do this as much as they can. Um, when centralized I say, configuration. Yeah, using GitHub or GitLab okay. to back up your entire config of your entire system. So you have one source of truth that you can roll out from. And we just started doing this before we had our first total production wipeout of our entire application clusters across all of our Amazon zones. Oh my gosh. And I remember being in the office <clears> and somebody said, I think what I'm about to do may wipe out our clusters. And I said, are you sure that's a good idea? And he said, oh, it should be fine. Kaboom, next <laughs> thing we knew, we had nothing. <laughs> so then we went into full-on system restore mode and rolled out everything, which is all the Kubernetes, all the Prometheus, all the FluentD, all the different Weave open source pieces. It took 45 minutes to get the whole system back up again. And we thought, wow, we shouldn't do that again. That was, that was silly. Um, well, we've also learned you should monitor things throughout the system. You know, monitoring is not something you add later. Monitoring, coding starts with monitoring today. That's a big change in the DevOps world. You know, as a developer responsible for operations, you must think about how to instrument your code from at the beginning. And this is another reason we love Prometheus, is it makes it actually very easy to do that, and pretty intuitive. What is it about Prometheus that makes it easier to do than, than, it's, than, than the technologies that you would consider as peers? It's got spectacular support for lots of application code in different cases, already there in the community. That's one of the main reasons we like it. Um, so you can get productive really on day one with all the things you need to see. You know, it already pre-integrates with Docker. That's a recent change, by the way, and Kubernetes. It pre-integrates with all the components in our stack. So for us, it reduces our integration burden. We don't have to go out and do that donkey work because it's been done for us by the community already, which is really fantastic. Hmm. Hmm. Um, so what's, what's in store for you guys in terms of you know, at, you know, at Weave, what are some of the things, what is, you, know, you don't want to reveal your roadmap, but I'm just curious on how you're seeing things over the next six, 12 months. What do you expect, what are kind of the, the you know, you're looking into the crystal ball of the market, what are some of the things that you're, that you expect to see happen? Well, for us with our, with our products, um, we're still seeing amazing adoption of our open source, sort of 15% month on month right now, which is really great. The cloud product is what we're focusing on. Uh, and the EE version. So right there, we're building what we call joined up stories or, or production workflows, combining the different pieces of the stack. So combining monitoring with deployments, combining visualization with deployment. So you can see as you deploy something, what's happening in the visual version of the app, makes it easier to diagnose problems and compare the current state with the old state and things like that. So that's our focus. In the broader market, I think that we're going to see a big leap forward now that we've got a set of standard container technologies appearing in the CNCF. And I think we'll, you know, we've kind of reached critical mass now with Docker, Kubernetes, Coros, Google, and, and everybody else standing shoulder to shoulder behind one toolkit. And hopefully we'll see people like Amazon and Microsoft get excited about it too. And then we'll really start to see the payout of one toolkit for cloud native applications. And then people getting productive around that. Well, Amazon's famous for saying they want to give what the customers want, right? Right. I mean, so uh, how do you then extrapolate that into their participation potentially in the community and standing shoulder by shoulder with everyone else? Well, at Amazon, I think, you know, the Amazon Web Services team is a pretty amazing team. I mean, you know, we do a lot of work with them. We love how they work. The up until now, I think Amazon has not done much open source, right? They released Blocks last year, for example. That was a new step for them. 
They hired Aaron Cockroft, and he's, I believe, attached to some of these initiatives. But really, they've been a downstream consumer of open source when customers want it as a service. So I believe that, for example, uh, there are some Hadoop-based services for data processing available as Amazon MapReduce. But I think, so e even if Amazon only did that, but did it with all the cloud native stack, then I think customers would benefit. And it's something that customers will increasingly ask for. But now that Amazon have started doing their own open source, I hope we'll see them becoming a, a participant and a contributor as well. And in fact, within the Kubernetes community, there is an Amazon special interest group, which is, run, which is building Amazon images built by the community, for the community, for everybody to run. And I believe I've seen Amazon being a little bit involved there, which is really good news. Yeah, I know uh, Chris Nova, is, I haven't had a chance to talk with her about that. Talk to Chris, talk to, I think Chris Love is here as well. I think I saw him yesterday. And, Joe uh, Peter, I think, is probably. Joe, Joe is around, yeah, yeah. Luke, Luke is around. There's a few of us here. It uh, seems like there's an interest in VMware, too, in participating in something like that. I think so. It's, it's, it, what, what we noticed when Amazon started joining the AWS calls is suddenly everybody got, it, got, it, got really interested. Yeah. And it, it created a real focus. And I think that what will happen with that group is it will focus on Amazon first, but I hope it will then focus on images for other clouds, too. Right. VMware, VMs, Google, whatever they call it, cloud launches, and so on. Well, how about Microsoft then? Where, where, where is Microsoft right now? Well, Microsoft have done something pretty cool, which is they've written some open source network integration code right. using the CNI toolkit that was pioneered for, originally for Kubernetes, um, but then adopted by Mesosphere. And I think Docker is starting to look at it too now. Uh, there is an Azure CNI uh, out there, which they presented to the CNCF not too long ago. And I'm hopeful that in Q2 we'll see some uh, interesting things with networking in the CNCF. Well, great. Well. Well, Alexis, thank you very much for taking some time thank to you, talk Alex. today. It's always Appreciate fun it. to do this. We'd like to thank Cloud Native Computing Foundation for sponsoring our podcast from Cloud Native Con Kubicon Berlin.